You're voilà. Good morning, everyone. Isn't this wonderful? Yes. <laughs> Karen, thank you so much. This is like group therapy here after all of these months that we've been secluded, right? And um, I appreciate the, um, the invitation. Uh, thank you for coming here so early. I know that it's five o'clock somewhere, I guess, right? <laughs> But uh, the truth is that this is so reinvigorating for all of us. You know, I kind of forgot how is it that we used to give lectures? I'm used to doing them via Zoom on my underwear. <laughs> Today I actually put some pants on. <laughs> but anyway, so um, no, thanks Karen for putting this together. It, it's, it's an amazing amount of work, right? And we're so happy to, to be here. Thank you, Karen. All right, so um, my talk today is about COVID and cancer, or cancer and COVID. And I have to say that fortunately I have nothing to disclose except to say that COVID is the most annoying thing that has ever happened, right? And um, hopefully I'm not too biased against it. But when, when I said, well, let me talk about COVID and cancer, what rhymes with COVID and cancer? And I said, well, maybe uh, cookies and cream. Maybe that rhymes with COVID and cancer. But the truth is that it's not like that, right? It's, it's, it's more like maybe cosmos and chaos, right? If you think of it. Because um, our world was turned around and now things are not what they used to. So let's look at what happened. So from the very beginning, shutdown was the modus operandi, right? Um, there was a lot of economic unrest. The, um, we had to figure out how do we test for COVID? How do you diagnose COVID? All of us pretty much became experts in uh, the COVID world, right? And we were told that we had to socially distance right, that we had to social distance, do social distancing. And as humans, I don't think that any of us can do that because humans, we have to socialize. And I like the term more physical distancing than social distancing, but the truth is that everyone now says social distancing, which is not something that I like too much. And then they said, well, if you have any, any medical condition, you could die of COVID. And most people, have all of these comorbidities. You know, the, the amount of people that have hypertension, for example, it's huge. And so everyone was so scared with, with all of this. And then different states mandated different things. Here in Florida, you know, it, it, you know, the politics of everything, but some states really shut down completely. Others required, like you had to quarantine, right? And um, the schools closed, and uh, a lot of people had to become not, well, we were, we were parents, but we also had to become teachers, right? You had to be at home, uh, you couldn't leave your house. All of that anxiety, all of that cabin fever, and a lot of alcohol and domestic abuse started to happen. I like to abide by the World Health Organization guidelines that says that men should have maybe one or two drinks a day, and women should have one drink a day. So I got this glass, and this is uh, the drink that I have every day. <laughs> I go by the guidelines. But anyway, did any of you know what PPE was? I didn't know what PPE was. You know, PPE, uh, you know, PPE is, uh, whatever. So we all had to learn what PPE is, right? And uh, they said, well, we have to repurpose things. We have to transition. And I, uh, we started seeing that there were people that were non-essential. Is that, isn't that terrible, right? That they were saying that, oh, you're not essential. You have to go home. And so people were redeployed somewhere else. They told you, oh, you can't work anymore. You have to go do, do it remotely. How am I gonna do that remotely, right? A lot of people were forlorn and um, we had very limited resources at the beginning. We didn't really know how, how to 
how to approach this, this disaster. And everyone started to improvise, right? And there was uh, a lot of anxiety with, with all of this. Uh, we didn't have a good way of gathering data. And I think that we learned that this is something that we used to say, okay, well, how did we do last year, right? And you would look at the data from last year, but this is something that we need to do today, right? And so we started to learn how do we gather the data now? It has to be now. And we realized there's so many operational gaps. Uh, all of our work schedules were all, conf were all turned around and the famous and wonderful telemedicine. We had to now find out how are you gonna see patients? Um, they, ca they can't come to your clinic. So now we had to figure a way to be able to see them remotely. And this kind of things, how do you learn? How do we get educated? Um, it all changed overnight, right? All of the symposiums were closed. All of the educational things were closed. And Zoom, it's a wonderful and a terrible thing, but no, none of us knew what Zoom was. Uh, at least I didn't know what Zoom was. And I'm not talking about the Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. Um, this is the, the, flash, uh, the flash mobile, I guess. This is a picture of my son and me in the Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. Those apps are real, by the way. <laughs> okay. Now, what happened with physicians? So, a lot of us, well, fortunately, I didn't have to do this, but a lot of physicians had to retrain, right? Uh, we had to become COVID experts overnight. Patients were asking us all kinds of questions about COVID, and we didn't know anything about it. Um, I vaguely remembered what an N95 was. You know, I remember that they would say, you have to put on a 95, what is it? N95? That's for people that have tuberculosis. I'm never gonna see someone with tuberculosis. And, um, and all of those biosafety measures that we had to learn, uh, a lot of doctors had to work outside of their scope of practice. So if you were a pediatrician, they were asking you to go to the ER and take care of COVID patients, right? And there was all of this uncertainty, what should we do, all of this fear, the invisible enemy. It's still the invisible enemy because you can't see it. But there was a, a new sense of you had to be very clean. We're, we're all very clean. But you know, as surgeons, for me, it was much easier because you, know, you have to prevent infections in the OR, and I know how, to, you know how to take care of that, but most people don't know that, right? So they would put gloves, and then they would be touching everything and touching their phone and touching their face. Um, and they didn't realize that th that's not the way to do it. Um, but over time, I think that a lot of people, not only physicians, but overall, there was a lot of burnout. Practices had to close almost 12% based on uh, some surveys. Uh, some people thought about early retirement. And a lot of others said, oh, forget it. I'm just going to do an easier job, whatever that means. And all of us that are in the healthcare, uh, that are healthcare providers, realize the amount of psychological stress. You can see the numbers there. 72% of people thought that they were, well, think that they were distressed or they are distressed. 50% depression, can you imagine? 45% anxiety, 35% of people had insomnia. And right now we are in a state of pandemic fatigue, I think, you know, we're exhausted with all of this, right? So they had to develop, okay, let's see what we can do to coach people, to help them. We learned different ways to communicate we have now support groups, et cetera, and very important that we have to continue doing exercise and physical activities. Uh, but when you're at home in New York and you can't get out of your apartment, that's terrible, right? Thank God that we have Margaritaville and you can walk in the boardwalk here. We're very fortunate in Florida, things are open, you know, you have a lot of breeze and air and stuff, um, but in other places it's not like that. And there were a lot of increased ticks, not diverticulitis or this kind of ticks, but we know that the amount of kids, for example, children that, that now have all of these ticks has increased significantly because of COVID. The little ones are also very affected with all of this. And we had to stop doing surgeries, right? They told us you can't do surgery anymore uh, because um, all of those elective procedures, if you have a hernia, forget it. Come back uh, two years from now. We can't fix your hernia, right? Uh, we have to figure out what is truly essential. 
and we had to develop new protocols, develop new standards, right? Uh, develop like tiers of care when we used to say you have to flush your port every month. Forget about it. Don't flush your port. It's okay. You, you know, maybe every three months you can do it. No one knew if, if you could do that. But we started changing the way we would practice, right? And we found other things that could be done, a tailored approach as you see here. And this is an ever-changing, very rapidly changing environment where we had to triage patients. Okay, so, so let's say you have a breast cancer. Oh, that's not that, that. Let's take care of this patient that has COVID, right? Uh, and no visitors. I don't know what you guys think about this. I mean, there's certainly a very, it's very difficult for the patients. I understand that. It's wonderful for us because when you don't have visitors, right? Oh, you can get your job done, right? You don't have to deal with sitting in the, you know, after surgery, you have to go downstairs, right, and talk to the family, and it's like a, it's like a press conference, right? <laughs> Seriously. So it, it's wonderful, but it's terrible at the same time. And uh, unfortunately, we kind of are getting used to that. You know, I, I love it. I just make a phone call, the surgery went well, I have good news for you, it's gonna be okay. Oh, no, 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 you can't visit your family member. No, 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 it's not me, it's the hospital, you know, that kind of thing, <laughs> right? But in a way, it's wonderful. But if you are the patient, right, and you're by yourself, and you had made your surgery, and you're sitting there with pain, you would like to have your family member help you. So, you know, it, it's different ways of looking at things. And plus, minorities, and we have a lot of Hispanic population here, African-American population, um, certainly access to care is a big problem. And in, as far as clinical trials, we know that uh, those minorities really don't enroll that much in clinical trials. And unfortunately, we also have a higher COVID-related hospitalization rate, as well as a COVID-related mortality. And, um, Dr. Britt is one of the previous presidents of the American College of Surgeons, a giant of surgery, and he said something that is absolutely true, right? You cannot have quality without access. And with COVID, that became even worse because it was even more difficult to access care in many cases. Now, specifically about cancer patients, we know that uh, cancer patients, especially those that are undergoing treatment, have an increased risk of getting COVID and re getting really sick from it, right? We know that. And we also know that, and this is currently, that those that are vaccinated and get a breakthrough infection, 30 or 40% of those hospitalizations are in people that have immunocompromising diseases, including cancer. Um, and so what happened? You know, we were all stuck at home. No one wanted to come see you. Everything is telemedicine, right? And so the estimate is that there were 10 million, 10 million screenings for the three most common types of cancers that were missed during the last year, year and a half. And that translates into a reduction in the number, number of patients that were diagnosed. You can see here almost 50% drop in the diagnosis of the, five, the six most common malignancies. 50% decrease in new breast cancers. Look at this, 25%, Dr. Kunz loved this, um, pancreatic cancer, he, that's what he likes. But 25% drop in pancreatic cancer diagnosis. 94% of women stop doing their mammograms, their screening mammograms. And we, we're seeing this now. Okay, now women are usually much better, I'm, I'm not being sexist about this, but women in general are very good with their appointments. It's rare for women to cancel their appointments. But what we're seeing now is that more women actually canceled their appointments during COVID. Um, and it's also more common among the, uh, those that are a little bit more uh, older. I guess because of the fear of going to the hospital and uh, you know, being, being around other people. And we know that cancer patients are usually elderly, right? They have a bunch of comorbidities. We give them immunosuppressive therapies, right? 
Many times you even give them immunotherapy and we didn't really know how does that work with, with COVID. But we have to continue providing safe care, right? That is patient-centered, that's what we do, right? And we want excellent outcomes. So how can you do that in the middle of this disaster? And so we also know that 15% of people, right? And specifically with cancer uh, that have recovered from the COVID have this like post COVID syndrome, which includes all of these things that you see there, respiratory symptoms, fatigue, uh, weight loss, neurocognitive dysfunction. And so the, the worst your COVID was, the worst your, the sequela are, right? So patients that got really bad COVID uh, probably have a lot of the sequela. And if on top of that you have cancer, it's something to think about, it's a big problem. Just to give you an example, lung cancer patients uh, described that they had 31% increased anxiety. They were depressed, right? They had a lot of distress. But more importantly, like a fourth of them had to change their primary treatment. And um, most of it is because of the COVID itself. And this, uh, this translated into delaying treatment in a lot of patients or even stopping their treatment altogether. And now we are starting to see that the survival is less. We are just starting to see that, that the survival is decreasing because of all of this year and a half where we haven't, haven't been doing a lot of stuff. Worldwide, this is the, these are the numbers. There was a delay in the, uh, and disruptions in certain, oh, by the way, these are my headphones. This is not the headphone. This is uh, the most expensive equipment that we have in the operating room. Uh, we have a brand new surgery, surgery tower there at Sinai, and for some reason this happened to be close to the floor, so I sat down and I was able to hear my music is wonderful. Um, but again, there, there was a reduction in the number of surgeries, and the more COVID, less surgeries that we were allowed to do. We're very grateful because, or we're very blessed because at Sinai we have two different hospitals in the same hospital, and we had just bring a brand new surgical tower. So we kind of have two hospitals in one, but most places don't have it like that. Most places, the third floor is COVID and the fourth floor is the orthopedic floor, and then the fifth floor is the operating room. So how do you manage that, right, in a hospital that, that, manage, that, that works like that? And think of it, cancer surgery is not usually an emergency unless you're obstructed or you're bleeding or whatnot. But it is also not elective surgery. And they were canceling all of the elective procedures. And this is not elective. I, I like this. It's time sensitive and, and essential. It's essential surgery. You have to provide surgery. It's part of the treatment of all of the cancer patients. And it has to be multidisciplinary. How do we provide multidisciplinary care, right, when, when everything is, is uh, like a puzzle, right? Everything is in pieces. It's very complex. And yes, we had to change how urgent we would manage patients. And we learned that there's really a lot of potential different uh, treatment approaches that we can do. And the sequencing of how you do things, we had to figure out maybe we don't give you the, we don't give you chemotherapy, but we do the surgery, or should we wait for the surgery a little bit longer? We kind of had to think outside the box. As far as clinical trials, I see that some of the, the people that are, that are involved in clinical, well, all of us are involved in clinical trials, but there was a lot of disruption in the accrual uh, in clinical trials because we had to minimize the, the in-person visits, and a lot of people were working remotely, and it's difficult enough for you to go through the consent for a clinical trial when you are sitting next to a patient. Can you imagine trying to do that via Zoom? It's very difficult, right? Um, and patients didn't want to come to the hospital to get tested. So the, um, the number of accruals really dropped and um, people seemed to be more interested or the government was more interested in the vaccines and the vaccine trials than on COVID, ther and COVID therapies and not on the cancer trials. And a lot of the investigators had to either stop or uh, delay their, their screening 
and there was definitely a decrease in the enrollment in clinical trials. And I think this will also translate into problems in the future because it was, it's like everything stopped for a year and a half. And so uh, we'll have to see what the consequences of that is. 20% uh, of, you can see there, the new patient enrollment went down by 20%, com complete stop in enrollment. And we, again, we had to reprioritize the enrollment to some higher priority trials. For the cancer programs, this is also a big issue. Think of it, the financial burden that we already had, and now we have less funding, right? Because they're interested is in COVID and the vaccine, not in the cancer trials, right? So from a federal level, we had less funding. Philanthropy, you know, they were interested more in COVID than in anything else. And the industry was really suffering because uh, a lot of the, uh, of the trials had to be stopped. So uh, we had, again, to become very resourceful to adapt and to, and to kind of improvise. So I wonder, are, are you sufficiently depressed already with my talk? <laughs> I feel like exhausted, right? We all do, and that's why this is so nice. This is so nice. <laughs> but truly, I mean, what else? All right, but no, 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 I, I think there's light. There's light at the end of the tunnel. So uh, the recovery, and we have to start thinking about this now. So it has to be done in a stepwise fashion, right? Uh, thank God that little by little, some of the restrictions are being lifted. Um, I think that less and less we're going to have Zoom and uh, like remote things, but it's still something that we learned how to do. And a lot of patients like the not to be in person, but to do a, a telemedicine visit. And that's perfectly fine. For certain things, you can do that. I hate this, the new normal. I don't like that phrase, but we're stuck with it, right? So we're getting used to the new normal, whatever that means. Now we have vaccines and now we have that problem that I respect people that don't want to get vaccinated. But the problem is that there's so much misinformation, right? And they have politicized the vaccine so much. And it frustrates me that I, I have to spend five minutes with the patient looking at their incision, making sure that everything is healing fine, and then 20 minutes discussing the vaccine. You know, oh, I don't want to get vaccinated. Okay, that's fine, but why don't you want, you know, and, and you, have, you spend a lot of more time now going over all those things and how important we, you know, I personally think that it's important, especially for, uh, for cancer patients to get vaccinated. Um, we are definitely seeing more advanced disease. I can tell you the amount of women that didn't do their mammograms in 2020, you know, it's, it's amazing. And I said, oh, I skipped my mammogram in 2020, now, now I have breast cancer. It's every single day. I'm seeing this every single day. The same thing with head and neck cancers. Oh, I've had this lump. When did it start? Uh, last year, you know, during COVID. I was at home, you know, drinking, and I just realized that I have it now. Okay. But certainly, you know, late presentation of disease, the staging um, is, is, we have now, uh, the stage of the disease is higher. And although this is anecdotal, we're, we're all seeing it. I, I think we're all seeing it. And don't forget, cancer just doesn't disappear. <laughs> it's still there. It's just that we're not diagnosing it the way it's supposed to. Here you go. 1.8 million new diagnoses of cancer every year in the United States and 600,000 cancer deaths every year. I think yesterday was 700,000 patients have died of COVID in the US. Yesterday was the 700,000 mark. All right, and people are still scared of, I'm still scared of COVID. That's why I'm getting my third shot today, later today. Okay, anyway, but the fear of COVID is still there. We still use masks, you know, we still social distancing, you wash your hands, you know. If someone sneezes, oh my God, <laughs> right? You can't sneeze anymore, <laughs> you have to hold it. All right, I'm not gonna say anything else because if your mask works properly, you shouldn't be able to smell anything, right? That's it. So if you hold your sneeze and you, okay. So anyway. <laughs> and now there's this rebalancing, right, of um, 
public health messaging and initiatives, and politics, oh my God, the politics. It's terrible. I don't care if you're Republican or Independent or Democrat, whatever. We, we have to have at least one message that all of us can agree on, you know? But the way this has been politicized is so terrible, absolutely terrible. Anyway, uh, don't forget, and we know this, right? Cancer is still the number one cause of potential life years lost, despite COVID. And it just doesn't go away. And eventually it's going to be business as, I guess, unusual. It's not business as usual. But don't feel bad. Don't feel bad. We have accomplished really so much, right? I think so. We've learned so much, so much in so little time of things that we, we didn't really know about. And um, a, a little bit of a, a year ago, my wife said, uh, you know what, you need to get toilet paper. And I, what? You need to go buy toilet paper on your way back home. I'm like, we have enough toilet paper at home. Why do you need more toilet paper? No, everyone is buying toilet paper. You need to get toilet paper. <laughs> All right. So I got toilet paper. That was the picture. <laughs> that was the last one. I was, yeah, I got it. If any of you need toilet paper, I still have toilet paper from last year. <laughs> I still do. <laughs> okay, but yeah, we transitioned from toilet paper to vaccine, which is a good thing. Okay, and we kind of reinvented ourselves, right? We reinvented ourselves. We've learned so much, so much about everything, right? We, we learned to appreciate so many little things that we never appreciated, like this being close again, right? Last night, sorry that they didn't, we couldn't invite all of you, but there was a la nice dinner program last night, right? Going to a restaurant and having a drink. I was like, oh, wow, yeah, I remember how this is. Uh, you know, having a nice meal, being with friends, being with family, right? We, we start appreciating all those little things. Um, gratitude to everyone that is around you, right? Um, you, uniting, you know, families reunited again. Uh, we didn't used to talk to uh, remote family members and now we assume you can talk to them and you realize, oh, this is also, this is also nice, this is also important. And it, I, I really think that this has been a test in our humanity, I really think so. And I think that despite all of the adversity and all of these things, I think we are better people because of COVID. I really do. Um, from a pure humanistic point of view, I think that we've learned so many things about us and about what is really important in life that I think that we're better people. Thank you, thank you, COVID, okay? And so instead of it being cookies and cream or chaos and cosmos, when I put, you know, the, Google is wonderful, right? You put cookies, cream, chaos, cosmos. This is what shows up. Some Nike shoes. <laughs> if you want to get, they're pretty expensive. It's called the cookies and cream cosmos shoe. And I think this is what summarizes really what COVID is, right? It's not cookies and cream. It's not also chaos and cosmos. It's like a mixture of all these things. And we just need to look ahead, right? Look at the future. Forget about what happened yesterday. We are better people, I think. We've learned so many things. And for us at Sinai, this is the future. We're going to be building a brand new... <laughs> This is the future. We're gonna be building a brand new cancer center. We're so excited about all of this. Uh, we already have built, and this is the, the, the way the hospital looks now, a uh, beautiful surgical tower um, that is completely separate from the old hospital where we used to do things. Um, and, you know, overall I think that the future is bright. You always have to think about that. Um, but we also learned that 
Now we're seeing patients that are coming at a more, much later stage. And that's going to be a big problem and a big challenge for all of us. Now, a few months ago, like in May, I think it was, they invited me to give a, <laughs> they invited me to give a motivational speech, right? Um, for some, like a, a little award ceremony that every year is done by a group called the Medi Law Group and uh, the Florida Business Group, uh, where they recognize you know, physicians, dentists, uh, podiatrists, things like that. They do that every year. And because of COVID, they had been unable to do it. So in May, think about it, this is a few months ago, right in the middle of COVID, they decided to do it again. And I was so hesitant to go, but they said, you, 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 maybe give us a little motivational speech. And I'm, I'm like, I'm not really motivated to give a speech right now. I really not. But I said, okay, let me go and, and do it. And they, they showed a little video. Maybe can we, can we? So they showed this video, and I, I thought it was wonderful because we usually recognize, okay, this is the chief of this, and that's the chief of that, and this is the CEO of this, and this is the CFO of that. Um, but what they did is that um, they, they recognized the ancillary personnel of the hospital, you know, which is not that we, don't, don't care about them. It's just that we usually never think about them as someone that we should recognize, right? And so uh, each hospital kind of gave their candidates of who was the person that they wanted to recognize. And it was beautiful. You know, they had the janitors, they had the nurse assistants, they had all, all of those people that were nominated. But they put together this video and I asked them if I could share it with you. Um, I'm not gonna show the nominees because that's at the very end, but I, I think it's a good summary of what has happened. Uh, so I hope, I hope you like it. I didn't make the video, it was, they, they were the ones who did it. But let's see, I just hit the space bar. Here we go. Tonight, the CDC says the infected passenger passed through busy SeaTac Airport in Seattle, the first confirmed U.S. case of the contagious coronavirus now in Washington state. And the virus now spreading, reaching Australia and Europe with confirmed cases in France and nine other countries, including the U.S. Two patients are confirmed to have the virus in Washington and Illinois. And health officials are watching more than 60 other possible cases across 22 states. A grim COVID-19 milestone south of our border. The death toll in the U.S. now surpassing 1,000. Every patient inside this New York emergency room has COVID-19. It's one of three hospitals in the state fully dedicated to treating the disease. I think it's emotionally hard to prepare for this level of sickness and suffering. Repeated calls for code 99, which means a patient needs immediate help to keep breathing. We're having, uh, I would say, 10 code 99s every, uh, every 12 hours. Still, the number of deaths is so staggering, funeral homes can't keep up. 9-11 was horrific, but it was a singular event. What makes this harder is you are, you're, you don't know when it's going to end. These are the troops on the front lines of this new world war. The nurses, emergency responders, doctors, scientists, and hospital staff defending us all against an advancing and invisible enemy. 40,000 retired healthcare professionals and newly graduated students stepped up to serve in the besieged and makeshift hospitals at the new epicenter of this global outbreak. In scenes reminiscent of the World War II home front, many quarantined Americans put their sewing machines to good use, crafting makeshift versions of face masks. Gestures of gratitude from the public told that the most useful thing they can do is to simply stay home.
There you go. So all of you are the heroes behind the front lines. Thank you so much. I wanted to keep it uh, short so we have time to, um, if you have any questions or any comments, so we can. It's beautiful. Oh, thank you, thank you. But, <laughs> you know, I got chills when I saw this. <laughs> it was, right? You, you realize all of the things that have, that have happened. Um, any questions, any comments? Please comment. Can someone come to the microphone, give their experience? No? Oh, thank you. No, no, no. But yes, that's what we have to do, right? Look at the future. And uh, we've learned so many things. I, I really think so. We're better now. We're better people. I think we're better people. We've always been good, but now we're better. All right. Well, thank you, Karen, for the invitation. Huh?